invite you to orient your hearts and your minds toward the worship of God this morning as we come together in praise.
So my name is Naomi Walters. I am the chair of the Department of Theology and Ministry at Rochester University, just around the corner. Um, we've been worshiping here with y'all since Advent-ish. This is Ezra. He's going to help me with the announcements today. Um, and if anyone has an announcement that they want to add to the end or an announcement that they feel super passionate about, it's just going to be a little bit of a free-for-all, but otherwise we're um, just reading the ones in the bulletin. So, uh, this week, the needs of the food pantry are mushrooms, mayo, canned potatoes, and canned salmon. Do you want to read this part? No. Okay, they can always use cloth and paper bags. Um, and we have a pet therapist today, Izzy, who is here for Snuggles. Izzy is a beagle pointer mix being hosted by Abby and Lisa. So stop by in the fellowship hall after service today um, to, be, to be calmed and loved by Izzy and show some love back. Um, we have adult fellowship February 28th via Zoom. The Ukraine relief concert that we attempted to do earlier um, in Advent, I think, has been rescheduled for March 4th. And someone's excited. <laughs> yeah. The Ukrainian concert. So we have a local musician um, who is a bandura player, which is a traditional stringed instrument for Ukraine. He lives here and is actually the father of a very good friend of my son. Um, so that's how I met him. Um, he is, his parents are from Ukraine. He was born here and raised. However, his wife is Ukrainian and his stepson, and they have been over here for four years. And so it's a little bit about their experience living here so far away from their beloved family over in the Ukraine, as, or in Ukraine, as well as um, Benya Stewart, who is a guitarist who plays traditional Appalachian music that has fallen in love with Ukrainian music. So it's this interesting blend of folk and Ukrainian and he actually has been traveling back and forth from the States to Ukraine. He has done four trips now to the front lines, actually entertaining the troops there. So he will have stories of what he has firsthand witnessed. He also is taking up funding for um, medical kits that go to the emergency front line where it's to help stop bleeding, that kind of thing. So he has taken thousands of dollars worth of equipment over there. And so we're having a fundraiser, hoping that at this one year anniversary that we can continue to support Ukraine in, in even small ways of just dollars here and there. So please come next Saturday and in, be enjoyed by story and song and just learning a little bit more about Ukraine. Thanks. Yeah. The next blood drive will be held March 14th, so make your appointment at um, the redclawcrossblood.org. And um, Ezra wants to do the bowling announcement, so here you go. Come join us for, for, for a day of bowling. Do this for Cam. I, I'm going to guess Talahi. Talahi? Flyers are in the narthex. <laughs> All right, people, get it together. <laughs> Usually by now, I have all of my lanes filled for bowling. I know I switched it from Palm Sunday, and that might be throwing a few of you off. Yet at the same time, fill out the paper and get it to me. We cannot be church of the last minute for this because we told Tom we were going to have the numbers to him by the Sunday before. So I'm responsible for this, and I will be hounding you. I will start to approach you individually and in small groups starting um, today after church to get the papers from you, okay? Um, yeah, we're, we have amazing door prize baskets coming. So um, if you just want to come and have pizza with us, I think it's only like 10 bucks. If you want to have pizza and pop and hang out with us and get a chance to win some of the amazing door prizes, it does involve baking by Lisa Young, and also Girl Scout cookies. We've got animal baskets, all kinds of cool stuff. You don't have to get an animal. It's for your animal. But I'm just saying, you guys, um, let's just amp it up a little bit. I had more faith in you to be signed up for bowling by now. Who has a question? The flyers are out there. They are. Uh, Kim promised me that they would be out there. So so they're there, see? They're there. I can deliver them to you. If you want to put your hands up in the air like you just don't care, I will bring them around to you, pronto. Okay? Oh, here, Bruce is doing it. Put your hands up if you want the bowling flyer. Pull it together, people. 
Let's get signed up. Even if you can't pay me today, I need to hold your spot. Camp is counting on you. Not sure any of you are going to remember this anyway, but I had previously said that game night was going to be the second Tuesday of um, the month, um, but that interferes with the blood drive. So it'll be the third Tuesdays of the month starting in March. And every once in a while that date might interfere with something, but I just, I don't even think you guys will remember that. Like, that's not like a priority in your head, but okay. Thank you. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, we are still going. <laughs> ourselves in a call to worship. I would like to thank everyone who has participated in the meal train for Pastor Scott and Kristen. If you would still like to, to do so, please let me know and we will schedule you, but thank you so much. So let's lift our voices up for the call to worship. Please rise. God has called us together today as a sign of God's reconciling love in Christ Jesus. Peace to those who are far away and to those who are near. We worship today in gratitude for this peace that we share with God, with each other, and all of creation. And please join me in our prayer of invocation. Come, living God, and make us a people of your peace. Come, risen Christ, Prince of Peace, and do your saving work among us. Come, Holy Spirit, and heal us so that we might be servants of your peace. The theme of this scripture today is forgiveness, and I just wanted to share that as I read this scripture verse to you. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. 
Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. Our second scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And in this scripture, Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Satan's temptations focused on three crucial areas. The first one, physical desires. The second, possessions and power. And the third, pride. These are familiar because we face the same kinds of temptations every single day. When we are tempted, we remember to turn to Jesus Christ for strength. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, God will command the angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only your God. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. And as we are tempted, we need to remember to lean into God for strength. Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen.
like to come down for the children's moment, be you a child or be you a child at heart, you are welcome to come join us. So I wanted to tell you two things that the Bible says are true about humans. That's you and me. One is that humans are great. So one way the Bible talks about that is by saying that we are made in the image of God. That means that we're a little bit like God. We can show other people what God is like by being creative the way that God is creative or by being loving the way that God is loving. We can see what God looks like when we look at each other. So I'm wondering what is something that makes you feel great or something that makes you feel big or something that makes you feel strong. Adults can share too. What's something that makes you feel great? Or me, someone who loves you, that makes you feel great, right? Um, what's something else that makes you feel great? Maybe when someone tells you that they can tell that you worked hard on something. They said, I can see you worked really hard on that and that makes you feel great. What else? What makes you feel big or strong? When you drink milk, right, when you take care of your body, when you put good nutrients into it, or when you exercise, you move your body in a good way. Um, ringing the bell when you make something beautiful, right? That makes you feel great or big or strong. Um, petting a dog, right? When we're um, engaged in God's good world the way that we are meant to be. Um, Maybe when your body does something strong like running or jumping super high or when you help someone. Maybe all those things remind us that we are great, that God thinks you are amazing. Also, the second thing that I wanted to tell you today about humans is that we are small. So maybe that's kind of the opposite of the first thing, right? <laughs> that we are both great and small. But somehow, they are true at the same time. So one way that the Bible talks about this is by saying that humans are made from the dust of the ground. So we are made in the image of God, and we are made from the dust of the ground. And that means that we're a little bit not like God. That we are created, but God is the creator. Nothing made God. So we don't always show each other what God is like. When we treat people badly instead of with kindness, or when we destroy things instead of taking care of them. Um, so can you think of anything that makes you feel small or weak or sad? Global warming, right? We feel small, we feel weak against climate change, Sophie. Right? Those math problems are pesky. When you can't figure them out, you're just trying to like untease this thing and you can't figure it out. You just feel small. Um, or maybe like when you look out at the night sky or at pictures from telescopes of all the universes and how big they are. Um, maybe when you stand by the ocean or a lake that's so big that you can't even see the other side of it. Or when you're in a city and you look up at like a super tall building. Um, she says, when your big brother steals something. Yeah, when someone else treats you in a way that doesn't recognize your full humanity, which is like a fancy way of saying it's not nice. Um, or when you think about all the places on earth you've never been, or when you walk into a room full of people you don't know, those things maybe make you feel small. So maybe those things remind us that we are not the center of the universe or the center of God's story. So there's this old Jewish story or proverb that says that every person should have two pockets with a scrap of paper in each of them. And I live in a gendered society and therefore have no pockets today. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, it's just not fair. It's an injustice. Anyway, in those two pockets, you should have one piece of paper that says something like, I am great, or I am made in the image of God. And then in the other pocket, you should have a piece of paper that says something like, I'm small, or 
I'm made from the dust of the ground. And so then whenever you start to feel too proud or full of ourselves or start to think that we're better than somebody else or better than God, we could pull out the piece of paper that says, I'm small or I'm made from the dust of the ground. But whenever we start to feel too discouraged or too hopeless, we should look at the piece of paper that says, I'm great. I'm made in the image of God. So there is a song about this story that I think is very fun to listen to. So I have some instruments here, and I thought we could have a little musical parade and listen to the song on your way out to prayer party. But we've got to take a lap around the, the whole room first. Hold on. Um, so let's, um, I thought we would end with a parade, but usually we do that pray, repeat after me thing. So can you um, grab an instrument and then pray, repeat it? Or like a dancing scarf? Yes, there are a variety of things here. And um, any adults who want an egg shaker or a dancing scarf can grab them and join the parade too. Um, but first, let's pray, okay? And then we'll turn on the song. Ready? God, when I think I don't matter... God, when I think I don't matter, help me to remember that you think I'm great. And when I am selfish, help me to remember that I am small. Amen. And now we'll dance our way out. Deep down here inside my pocket, there's a little piece of paper. Take it out and read it. I'm feeling out of shape to keep my fears at bay. It says you are great. Deep down in my other pocket, there's another piece of paper. Take it out and read it. I'm getting into shape when I'm walking tall. It says you are small. Because you are great and small. You are tiny. So I wrote that down on a little piece of paper, read it every day. Remember, you are great. Then again, I know we built a lot of tall, tall steeples. The whole wide world is more than just us people. So through it all, remember, we are small. Because we are great and small. We are tired. Inside my pocket, there's a little piece of paper. I'll take it out and read it. I'm feeling out of shape to keep my fears at bay. It says you are great. Deep down in my other pocket, there's another piece of paper. Take it out and read it. You all are good. You all are good sports. <laughs> well, actually, that's kind of it. That's the sermon. <laughs> uh, we're great. And we're small. And if you can't say it in a way that kids can understand, it's possible that you shouldn't say it at all. But since we're all here, and since the kids went back to prayer party and we want to give them the chance to be together in that way, I can try to say the same thing a more complicated way. <laughs> so as many of you know, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday the day in the Christian calendar that begins the season of Lent. So just like the season of Advent is a season of expectation and preparation for the coming of God in flesh as Jesus the Christ, which we then celebrate throughout the season of Christmas, the season of Lent is a season of preparation for something too. Lent is a season of repentance and confession that prepares us to greet the Christ's resurrection as genuinely and surprisingly good news. So the practice of fasting, which many Christian traditions now engage during the season of Lent, began in the earliest centuries of Christianity with those who were preparing to be baptized. 
And as part of their preparation for baptism, they fasted for a few days beforehand. And by the 4th century, this one- or two-day fast had become a 40-day fast, a number that is echoed throughout the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, and the New Testament. 40 days adrift in the ark, 40 years in the wilderness wandering, 40 days waiting for Moses to return with some guidelines for how life works best, 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness to prepare for his ministry and more. And around the 4th century is also when Lent came to be attached to the holiday of Easter. So if baptism is dying and rising with Christ, what better day to be baptized than on Easter? And so it wasn't much of a jump from there to extend the invitation of fasting and repentance to all the members of the church, rather than just to those preparing to be baptized. The promise of new life is for all, for those reaching toward participation in God's life for the first time, and for those seeking to renew their commitment to making the ways of Jesus their way of life together for the sake of God's world. And because we are small, because we are not perfect, the wisdom of what eventually became the liturgical calendar or the Christian calendar is that we could all use an annual invitation to take stock of the places in our lives where we feel called to embody God's good news more fully. So, the season of Lent begins on Ash Wednesday with the invitation to remember that it is from dust we came and to dust we return. It is an invitation to remember our weakness, our frailty, our finiteness. And my family has been reminded of this very thing this past few days as Ash Wednesday became Ice Wednesday. We have been without power since the wee hours of the morning between Wednesday and Thursday. And this has made it quite obvious to me how very little about my life is actually within my control. Um, and this is very unsettling to me. It does not come naturally to me to experience myself as weak. It's also not generally encouraged by the American cultural environment that shaped and shapes me. An environment that encourages us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, to be independent and self-sufficient, to strive to make ourselves or our country great. There's quite often a sense of shame attached to weakness. So, thanks be to God that Lent is an invitation to learn from the life of the Christ who did not regard divine strength as something to grasp or to cling to, but instead emptied himself and became human, became weak, became Jesus. And... As if the incarnation itself were not good news enough, Jesus continued throughout his life to reject power in all the forms it was offered to him. He chose instead weakness, vulnerability, surrender, and sacrifice to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this is what we see Jesus doing in our gospel text for this morning from Matthew 4. He resists the temptation to live in evil's story and embodies instead the counterintuitive story of God. First, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is offered a narrative of scarcity, a story in which characters must do whatever is necessary to make sure that they are safe or self-sufficient. And he chooses instead to trust in God's abundance. 
And we can see the same narrative of scarcity motivating much of our political discourse. We're told to be nervous about those who might take our jobs or our funds or our safety. And these fears invite us to go to great lengths to protect ourselves or to store up more than we need, stockpiling food or toilet paper. But there is another voice, perhaps quieter, but no less true, inviting us to, be, to remember that we do not live by bread alone, and that even if we did, God is the kind of God who gives us our daily bread. Just enough bread for today. So in the reign of God, we do not need to fill up. We are invited instead to fast. Or, as folks say this time of year, to give up something for Lent. My guess is, if you've ever practiced a spiritual discipline for Lent, it was fasting. That is the most commonly known Lenten practice. However, there are actually three historic or traditional spiritual practices that go with the season of Lent. Fasting, yes. Almsgiving, which is an old-fashioned word for charity or service. And prayer. And I think we can see the wisdom of those other two practices handed down to us by our ancestors in faith as ways to resist the other two temptations Jesus encounters in Matthew 4. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, God will command the angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is offered a narrative of stardom or invulnerability, a story in which characters must do spectacular things in order to prove their worth. Throw yourself off the temple. And he chooses instead to trust in God's vulnerability, to trust that risk is always part of what it means to love. We, too, are quite often invited to do something big and spectacular, to produce and to hustle, to work hard and to stay busy. It can be difficult to hear a still, small voice inviting us to worry less about being remarkable and more about being faithful. Perhaps... The invitation to the Lenten practice of prayer is one way we can orient ourselves back toward the reign of God, in which we are called not to prove ourselves, but to offer ourselves. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to him, all of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, accuser, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Jesus is offered a narrative of power, a story in which characters desire and acquire kingdoms and splendor and power and control. He chooses instead to embody God's path of self-giving. A path in which generosity, not prosperity, is a fruit or evidence of the Spirit. And we can see again the ways that these ancient temptations continue in our contemporary contexts. The desire to take charge, to consume, to control, is found somewhere in every one of us. And, as with the first two temptations, it is not primarily more knowledge that enables us to resist the script that is handed to us. 
What we need is a practice, a counter liturgy that helps us rehearse or rehearse our way into a different story. The practice of almsgiving, giving your time or your resources or your energy to someone or something else, is just one way to begin to rehearse our way into resistance. So this story in Matthew 4 invites us to resist the narratives of scarcity, invulnerability, and power or control with God's story of abundance, vulnerability, and generosity. The season of Lent more broadly reminds us that a little bit of holy weakness is the way of Christ and invites us to make that our way of life. And some of us may not need that reminder, being all too familiar with our own weakness already. So perhaps, in those cases, the season of Lent becomes an opportunity to be surrounded by a community of faith whose chosen weakness in this season is a display of solidarity. That you are not alone. Christ and a great cloud of witnesses stand with you in your weakness. And in either case, whether you need the reminder or need the solidarity, or both. The invitation of the season of Lent is an invitation to do something unsettling, foolish, and unrespectable, to live boldly in weakness, to remember what God already knows, that it is from dust we come and to dust we return, to remember, in fact, that God does not shudder or scoff at our dustiness, at our humanity, but instead enters into it, choosing the weak things of this world to the embarrassment of the strong, and the foolish things of this world to the great embarrassment of the wise. In the reign of God, it is by recognizing our smallness that we become most truly a part of God's great Good news. Let's sing together.
invite you now to share your joys and concerns, the things that we want to be heard in the presence of God and each other. Well, um, folks we love coming to live more nearby. Yes, so uh, a, f a friend whose um, nephew has been in an accident and is in critical condition. We need healing and wisdom. It's with great joy I see uh, Gail Kemmer back in our worship service. I should probably repeat that for our online friends, yeah? <laughs> friends who have rejoined us today for worship. Thank you. Please, uh, Ongoing prayers against the evil of gun violence and for those who are affected by it. Yes, healing for Phyllis and ongoing prayers for peace as we this week pass the one year anniversary of war in Ukraine. Safe travel for all of those in ice and snow. I would sure like power back, so I'm going to add that to the list too. <laughs> Let us pray. God who pays attention to us, help us to pay attention to you in this moment and in all our moments. We are especially attentive today to the joy of friends who now live nearby and to the sadness of friends who have experienced pain and are in critical condition. Please heal Tom and give Joan wisdom. We think of with, with joy of the friends who are able to be with us in worship today and with sadness for those affected by gun violence. We ask your healing for Phyllis. We ask your healing for those engaged in war in Ukraine and for your peace. We ask for safe travels for those who must drive in bad weather. We ask for power for all those without power. God the Spirit, who helps us in our weakness, please intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. God, the creator who searches the heart and knows the mind, work all things together for good. God, the Christ who knows what it is to be human, transform us into the image of God. It is in your name that we are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will it be able to separate us from your love. And it is in that love that we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us away from temptation, deliver us from evil. For yours are the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. I believe now is the time for ushers to come forward as we offer gifts and songs.
prayer of dedication. God makes a complete self-offering to us in Jesus. In response to the self-giving of God, we offer our lives back to God, to each other, and to God's world. May all our gifts help us share a common life with each other and with our neighbors in Rochester. And now, may the God who has reconciled all things in Christ Jesus fill us with love and peace so that we might be faithful servants in God's world. Go in peace. Passing the peace as you go. Thank you.